In this video, I'm going to show you how to upscale and enhance your Sega Dreamcast games using the Flycast emulator. With these guides, I explain every single option and more importantly, show you what it actually looks like. So by the end of the video, you'll know what you're setting, why you're setting it, and if you should be setting it in the first place. Now Flycast is pretty straightforward with its graphics options and there's not really too much to cover here. So let's just get straight into it. Obviously you want to start Flycast up and we're going to start with the general tab with the cable. This might seem insignificant but it's actually quite important. So the Dreamcast had a few different output modes but the main two were 480i and 480p. TV composite and RGB component will output at 480i whereas VGA will output at 480p which is much better for digital displays and emulation. There's a handful of games that are not VGA compatible, but those games, Flycast should step in and set TV composite for you. If you are using a modern digital display, you're probably not gonna see any differences between these. However, it does seem that more games have less issues when VGA is being used. As for graphics options in the general tab, that's all there really is. Now we can move on to the video tab. So starting with the graphics backends, and as much as I want to say Vulcan is the best, it's not quite there yet with this emulator. It works amazingly for some games, but for other games it causes frame pacing issues and visual glitches. Which is why I'll use DirectX 11 by default, because it has better compatibility than Vulkan, but it performs better than OpenGL. But if Vulkan or DirectX 11 don't work, I will use OpenGL as a backup because DirectX 9 is really only here for older versions of Windows and older machines. So unless you've got either of those, you can pretty much ignore this one. Transparent sorting definitely has a best setting and is per pixel. Using per pixel fixes a whole bunch of issues in way too many games to list. However, it is quite performance heavy, but I recommend try to get this on by default if you can. If you can't, definitely use per triangle by default and then activate per pixel on a per game basis if you need to. Now when you select per pixel, you get some additional per pixel settings appear down here. I would really only recommend messing around with these if you kinda know what you're doing, and if you don't, expect to break stuff. So moving down to internal resolution, and the higher you set this, the better the graphics are going to look. And also the amount of jaggies is also reduced without the need for anti-aliasing, because we are increasing our pixel count. Now what you see on screen now is what is recommended for your specific display. However, you can set it higher if you want to, to apply super sample anti-aliasing. Because this emulator doesn't have any anti-aliasing options at all, doing it this way might be a good option for you. Now one important thing to note about resolutions is that these half-step resolutions, so anything with a 0.5, these can look a little bit weird and can cause issues depending on your display. So I'd recommend steering clear of them. VSync for this emulator is recommended to leave it on by default, so you don't get any frame pacing or screen tearing issues. Show VMU in game does exactly that. Now full frame buffer emulation is a compatibility option and for the most part you don't really need to worry about it. You want to leave this off and let Flycast turn it on for the tiny handful of games that absolutely need it. Now these widescreen options are for hacking into anamorphic widescreen without stretching the image. And we've got two different options here. The top one is the internal widescreen hack, or we can hack widescreen by using cheats. And those cheats are included with the emulator. Widescreen cheats are definitely better to use. Because these have been made for the game specifically, they generally don't have any pop-in. The widescreen hack generally has loads of it. Not every game has a widescreen cheat, but there is a full list on the GitHub page, and I'll link this in the description below. So all you need to do is activate this, and it will automatically apply 16x9 for those specific games. Now if you want to stretch the image horizontally, you can do so with this option. But we all know how I feel about this, stretching is for heathens. In this little performance section, I'm only going to be talking about the shadows and the fog. You can deactivate the shadows in 3D games to get extra performance. However, I would recommend getting performance in other ways because you really want to keep this on. You can also turn the fog effects off for extra performance, but you can also deactivate this to make some games look a little bit nicer. Games like Marken X would apply that fog effect across the entire image, not just for aesthetic reasons, but to cover over some rough edges. But because we can increase our internal resolution and use anisotropic filtering, we don't necessarily need those fog effects anymore. As you can see, deactivating it for this game does make the image look a lot sharper. However, you may feel that these fog effects are dev intended and want to keep them in. Also, some devs use those fog effects on purpose for certain effects that you're actually meant to see. So this is definitely one to try out on a per game basis to make sure it doesn't break anything and if you actually like it. 
Delay frame swapping is more of a performance option and you should try to keep this on if you can, but you can turn it off as a last ditch attempt to get some extra performance. Fix upscale bleeding edge is what gets rid of those lines when you're upscaling. Definitely one to keep on for the most part. However, for some fighting games, it can warp their pixels. So for those, you may want to turn this off so that doesn't happen. Native depth interpolation is only meant for AMD and Intel GPUs. If you're getting some texture corruption and some stuff rendering on different layers, you can activate this to get rid of that. But again, only for AMD and Intel GPUs. Copy render textures to VRAM is more of a compatibility option that you don't really need to worry about. You can leave it off and Flycast should turn it on for the games that absolutely need it. Anisotropic filtering makes textures look sharper when they're being viewed at extreme viewing angles. And we've got up to time 16 available. This one isn't too performance costly, so I will set time 16 by default, but if you do need to squeeze some extra performance, you can dial this back. Texture filtering is normally something I'd say to set to your own personal preference, but for this emulator, I'm gonna go out on a limb and tell you what I think should be definitively set. So you want to use default for 3D games. This follows exactly the same filtering that the devs apply to the game, making it the most authentic and technically accurate. And you definitely want to force nearest neighbor for 2D games for a whole bunch of different reasons. But the main one being it fixes weird pixel edges in a lot of the fighting games. And in my opinion, it does actually look better. Force Linear will force that linear smoothing effect to every single texture in the game, including ones that didn't originally have it. And it can cause issues in quite a few games, so I tend to stay away from it. And finally, we have Texture Upscaling. Using this is quite performance costly, and it's only meant to be used with some 2D games. And when I say some, I really only mean the fighters for the arcade platforms. It doesn't upscale everything in the scene, it's really been designed to only upscale the 2D character sprites. This is only to be used by people that do not want a pixelated look. It's using XBRZ to upscale those character sprites, and I'm not the biggest fan of this look, but people do like it. And if you do want to use it, you can increase it all the way up to times eight. However, I would say stop around about times six, because if you go anything above that, you can start to make layers disappear. And if you don't want to use it at all, make sure that you keep it on times one. It's the same as having it off. Now, when it comes to giving advice on your defaults, there's really not much to give. Out the box, everything is pretty much set up as it should be. There was only three things that I found myself changing by default. And that was the internal resolution, the transparent sorting to per pixel, and the anisotropic filtering to time 16. All the other options I set up on a per game basis, like forcing nearest neighbor for the 2D games or setting up Vulkan. There we go, that was my full graphical options breakdown guide thingy for the Flycast emulator. Nice and straightforward and not too much to cover. And that's thanks to the somewhat straightforward nature of Dreamcast graphics in the first place. Unlike other emulators, this one doesn't need a whole bunch of other stuff to make it look good on digital displays. If you're into these kind of in-depth guides, I've already covered the Duck Station, Dolphin, PCSX2 and PPSSPP emulators. And I have no idea what I'm gonna cover next. And if you've got any ideas, let me know in the comments below. And if you found today's video helpful, slam me a thumbs up. And if you wanna keep up to date, you know what to do. And apart from that, go play some games. Adios.